Father, we come into your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for that access. Thankful for the wonders of your grace. For the realization that we are your children. And that you work in us to will and to do of your good pleasure. As we spend a few moments thinking about your word, may our Lord be exalted, may the Father be glorified in the Son, and may our hearts be stilled and settled on the wonder of our redemption. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. God doesn't change. About eight years ago or so, this fellowship met for the first time in cyberspace, something uh, couldn't, uh, I couldn't have imagined growing up. We've had a wonderful time of fellowship together. Many of those I knew when it started have either moved on to other pastures or by the grace of God gone to heaven. We began as an older fellowship those of you who have been with us for some time have probably aged significantly. I'm a witness to that in my own life. BHF could not have existed when I was a young man. There would have been no cell phones, no text messaging. Uh, there were no computers. There was no such thing as a megabyte, uh, much less a gigabyte or, or a terabyte. And now we even talk about petabytes. But there's one thing that hasn't changed, and that's our Lord. Everything that you know about Jesus Christ, at least everything that's significant, you got from this book. And I'm persuaded that I am reaching the end of my course. And I pray constantly that you will spend time in God's Word. I do not believe that you have a single privilege that can be compared with the privilege of holding in your hand the Word of God and feasting on it. I'd like to talk about in Christ, that phrase. The Apostle Paul's favorite phrase was in Christ. It's a wonderful thought. Our redemption is in Christ. We are not redeemed because we did anything. We're surrounded by what I call idol worship, and that idol is free will. Man actually worships that free will. If you want to be redeemed, you've got to do something. But there's no biblical basis for that. You were justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus declared you righteous without a cause, not because you accepted or believed or received or made Christ the Lord of your life or any other possible human action. You are in Christ because He died in your place. You didn't have anything to do with that. And you've been in Christ because He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. And because He died in your place, you are presented justified, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. The concept of being in Christ is almost staggering. We hear a lot about Christ in you, the hope of glory, and of course that's true. But you're in Christ. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So your redemption has never changed. Your security has never changed. Your relationship has never changed. You may feel it has. And it may be that in your walk and in your fellowship, you sometimes feel far from the Lord. But you need to forget those things which are past and press forward. You have no consciousness of sin, for it was placed on Christ. There's no condemnation in Christ because we're free from the law in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That verse is 
contrary to modern literature. No condemnation. People who call themselves Christians send me emails and talk to me about how sinful and condemned that they feel. Did God lie? Not that God has made sin of, of no consequence. The consequence is the death of Jesus Christ in your place. But what's that death worth? And what more needs to be done so that we stand before God uncondemned? Nothing. If there's any single thing that needs to be done, then Christ didn't do enough. More than that, He actually did not die in your place. Yet we know He did. And we are sanctified in Christ. Sanctified. Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Of all the New Testament epistles, the one that's most unlikely to have such a sentence in it as that is the one to Corinth. Filthy town. Even the Christians there were living lives that needed to be open to examination. But the letter from the heart of God says that they're set apart for God in Christ Jesus. And I can't imagine a safer place. That's what I have in Christ. There isn't a thing that could touch me that did not go through His loving hand. I'm set apart for God in Christ. And then I'm told that I always, I always triumph in Christ. We always triumph. We always triumph in Christ. Even what you may consider to be defeat is triumph in Christ. I don't know what His purpose is in your, li in your life. I I'll go further and say that I don't know what His purpose in my life is. But I know a God who doesn't lie, and whether I consider it to be triumphant or not doesn't make any difference. My God says, Stephen, whether you believe it or not, I always cause you to triumph. We know we have an enemy, Satan. In the battle that Satan wages against you, you are, whether you know it or not, in the middle of a conflict as Satan intervened in the lives of Adam and Eve, so he or, or his demons try to do that in your life. You may not recognize it. It's easy to blame things on yourself or others around you and never stop to think that it, it, it really is part of that spiritual warfare. Do you trust Him? Absolutely. I really trust Him. Blasted computer and, and we go off. I... I do it too. I don't, I don't want to do it. I suddenly pull myself up and hope against hope that my wife didn't hear me say that. I don't know what Satan may use in my life and what God may allow Satan to use in my life, but I'm certain some of that's been computers. But I've always won in Christ. I may not have seen the victory, but I am absolutely confident that I am triumphant. We are one body in Christ. One body together in Christ. So we being many are one body in Christ. Everyone members one of another. That to me is a profound verse of Scripture and one that bothers me a lot. I don't want to consider one member of the body better than another. Over the years, I've had people that I, I know uh, really don't like me, and I've said, you know, by golly, I'm going to make them love me some way, and sometimes I succeed, and sometimes I don't. There are none of us that have some kind of corner on truth, so that we have all those poor souls out there that don't know anything. Believe me. There are many members of the body of Christ who are starving for truth. It's too easy to look down on. I've thought many times, if one is overtaken in a fault, restore him 
And yet in the military, I don't see Christians doing that. You know, but in, in the military, when somebody was wounded, you don't even know him. You don't know who the guy is and you risk your life to save the guys behind. You know, four, five, six killed trying to rescue one pilot. Never seem to even question that. But a Christian that gets in trouble, man, that's, that guy's weird. You know, he's, he's really off the deep end. I can't have anything to do with it. And, and folks, I don't want to do that. If they are a member in the body of Christ, they need love. They need understanding. And they may need restoration. But we're members, all together members of the one body, the same body in Christ. We feast on Christ. And I've talked about this often. The, the heart of all this is, is that our nourishment, our food is in Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ and the body of Christ? Some of you may consider this to be an ordinance of the church. I get in trouble with people. I just, I just don't happen to believe there are ordinances. I look at, it, at an ordinance as something that Christians must do if they're Christians. I've had people say to me, you know, do you think a Christian could do this or that or, or the other thing? Folks, a Christian can do every single thing a non-Christian can do, including, this ought to drive a few of you away, denying Christ. Denying Christ. Even though the Scriptures say if we deny Him, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. Communion is a memorial. I believe absolutely what Christ was trying to teach His disciples is that if you're going to grow spiritually, if you're going to be nourished spiritually, if you're going to be healthy spiritually, you must feast on the blood and the body of Christ. And that's this book. I'm telling you that the church today, and by church I mean those who are God's people, feed very little on the blood and the body of Christ. The only place you can get that nourishment is in this book. And in worshiping the Lord, we gather together wherever we gather to say that His blood was shed for me, that I need to feast upon His body, the body of Christ, the Word of God, if I am to grow, if I approach communion in an unworthy manner, I approach that table in my merit. You know, it's nice that He died, but I've had many a, de a, a debate over the years with ministers about communion. You know, if, if you've committed any sin, go out and confess it before you come and take communion. You know, as though it's your confession that makes you worthy to come to that table. You're not worthy to come to that table. It doesn't say you need to be worthy to come to that table. It, what, it, what it says is, if you eat and drink in an unworthy manner, you eat and drink testifying to your total dependence upon the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If there's any other thing, any work of yours, you tarnish that table. Our nourishment is in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is our blessed hope. Our blessed hope. Name this channel that. Our hope is in Christ, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God, even our Savior Jesus Christ. I ask Christians, what do you hope? And they say, well, I hope I go to heaven. That's crazy. If you're in Christ Jesus, heaven is absolutely certain. You know, they say death and taxes are certain. I'm not even sure that's true. But believe me, heaven is certain because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. You hope you are saved? How can you say that? My sheep hear my voice. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. 
What is our hope? The return of Jesus Christ. He provides our nourishment and He's coming again. That's what your hope is. And I'm not sure how many Christians today have that hope clearly in mind. Our Lord is coming again. The critic says, where is the promise of His coming? All things continue as they were from the beginning. And that's not true. There have been great changes just in the last eight years. You know, I used to have a young, beautiful dog. Now I got an old dog with a gray beard. You know, things change. They're not the same. All things do not continue as they were. Our Lord is coming back. I don't know when. Absolutely wouldn't surprise me if He came today. And it wouldn't surprise me if He doesn't come before I die. But believe me, believe me, I'm going to see Him when my life here is through. Our hope is not only in Christ Jesus. It's the return of, of Jesus Christ to receive us unto Himself. You know, as often as you take communion, do it realizing that you are recognizing that that blood was shed for you and that that body is divided up as your food. And it, and it isn't you. It isn't your merit. It isn't anything you've done. It's Christ. So that you have hope in Him and stand before Him without spot and without blemish. God designs. I, I, I'm so big on His sovereignty, as you know. Let's talk about evil. All right. I believe this book to be God's Word. I believe it to be the Word of the sovereign, majestic, almighty God. And I believe what we know about God is not what we make up, not what we think He ought to be, not the kind of God we would like Him to be. That, that's what the pagans do. They fashion a God out of wood and then they fall down and worship it. The God we know is the God who reveals Himself in His Word. He may not be the kind of God we think He ought to be, but He is God and there is no other. There seems to be a tremendous hesitation among Christians to make certain that God is not charged with any evil the creeds say that God is not the author of sin. I also agree wholeheartedly that God is not the author of sin, but He openly declares that He is the one who created evil. Just look up the verse. You can argue from the Hebrew that, well, you know, that He doesn't really mean evil there. He means just calamity. But the Hebrew clearly indicates that He didn't need to create light because he is light, and so He forms the light, but He created darkness, and He didn't really need to create peace because He is peace. So He made peace, but He created evil. There seems to be among humans a great peace in, in saying that God doesn't cause tragedy. God wasn't responsible and God wasn't there. I'm not convinced that the word tragedy even belongs in the Christian vocabulary. I do not believe in your life that there is anything you could properly call scripturally tragedy. There may be things of great sorrow, great pain, great suffering, but not tragedy. Think, of, think back about 9-11, 2001. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that He did in heaven, in earth, in the seas, and in all deep places. Surely the wrath of man shall praise Thee. The remainder of wrath shalt Thou restrain. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no gods beside Me. One of the ways I find that Christians can explain an, an, an event like what happened on 9-11 2001 is the free will of man and that God in his permissive state allowed man free choice and it was man's free will that caused 
the number of deaths and the destruction that occurred. There's one enormous problem with that, and that is that if an earthquake had caused the destruction of those two buildings, and maybe the death of many more, it'd be very difficult to ascribe that to man's free will. I believe the Scriptures give us adequate evidence that our God is a God of design. Design. So I want to give you a few scriptural situations that I believe highlight that the fact that nothing happens outside the design, the foreordination of God Almighty. One would be our decisions. We see this with Joseph. You know, evil, evil choice, but God's design. Somehow you need to realize these aren't biblical stories. I think that's one of the problems with modern Sunday school. We, we teach young people the stories of the Bible. Folks, these are not stories. These are people. These are people very much like you. Jacob served for seven years to get Rachel as his wife. And the Scriptures declare that they were as nothing. That's how much he loved her. Every time I go to a wedding, you know, I, I hear all these profound statements like, well, you know, nobody ever loved a woman like I love this girl. And, and then the girl will say, well, nobody ever loved a man like I love this man. And, and then, you know, three months uh, later, they're arguing about a burnt roast or a toothpaste tube. Jacob loved Rachel. It's the same kind of love. The same adoration he had for that woman. They couldn't have any children. Finally, they had a baby boy. His name was Joseph. Jacob called him the son of his old age. To be sure, they had one more child, Benjamin, but, but she died giving birth to Benjamin. The jewel of his eye, the treasure of his life, the woman he loved more than anything died. All of the older brothers were very jealous, so jealous, in fact, that they got together and connived a, an evil plan. They're, they plotted to kill him, but Reuben thought better of that, so they sold him. They not only got rid of him, but they made money on the deal. And then they lied to their father. And that broken-hearted broken hearted old man almost died. Not only had he lost Rachel, but now he lost the son of his old age. He loved Joseph so much. And I don't know how to put in human language the sorrow, the pain, and the suffering that must have been in that old man's life. Neither can I enter in in any way to the consciences of his brethren. They knew he had been sold into slavery. I don't know whether they ever finally broke down and confessed to their dad that, that Joseph wasn't dead. We have no indication that they did. Neither can I adequately explain in any kind of terms what must have gone through the minds of those brothers. You know, when they were in Joseph's presence in Egypt, Now therefore do not be grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For it was God who sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me to preserve your prosperity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. I can only reach the conclusion that God designed that whole incident and you can say, well, what right did God have to put Jacob through all that sorrow, that, that anguish, and that suffering? Well, you, you have to argue that with God. I won't. I know that my God does all things well. And the design that sold Joseph into Egypt was God's design. You can argue that, that well, if he, if he is sovereign, there didn't have to be a famine in Egypt. Israel didn't need to be in Egypt Folks, it was God's design. How do you think that affects your life? 
Evil teaching. I, I suggest to you that evil teaching is the design of God. I don't want to teach evil. There's no way that I can know all truth. I believe it, it, it's a, a frightening responsibility to handle the Word of God. I don't want to teach error. I've mentioned this over and over again. I, I would infinitely rather not teach at all than to teach error. Why would God send a false prophet to prove? I don't know. But I know He did, and I know He does. The question has often been proposed, you know, why do so few Christians seem to understand real serious biblical truth? I don't know. But my Bible says God can send an evil prophet for a purpose that pleases Him. It's His design. We don't much like talking about suffering. Human suffering. And of course, you know, I'm going to to go to Job here. I have to read a few verses. You know them. You know them well, I'm sure. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the, and the asses uh, feeding beside them, and, the, and the, the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they've slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I'm the only one that escaped. And while he was still speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up the sheep. The servants consumed them all, and I'm the only one that escaped. And while he was saying this, well, there came another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels, carried them away, slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and, and I'm the only one that got away. And while he was still saying this, there came another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and there came a great wind from the wilderness. It smote the four corners of the house, it fell upon the young men. They're all dead. I'm the only one that got away. Now, you all know the story, and you say, well, God didn't do that. Satan did that. God said, have you considered my servant Job? He's righteous in all of his ways and sins not. Now we know there is no man that sinneth not, but God doesn't look on your sin. God sees you as righteous. I pointed that out in numerous studies. You are not sinners saved by grace. You are saints who occasionally sin. God sees you as a saint, righteous. And Satan said, well, of course I can't touch him. And you say, well, God permitted Satan to touch him. If God didn't design it, why do we use the word permitted? What we're trying to say is God didn't really want it to happen. God didn't want Satan to touch Job's life. God didn't want Satan to go through all of this. You can say God permitted it. I'm going to say God designed it. If God hadn't intended all that to touch Job's life, it would not have touched his life. Realize, folks, that Job is an individual and it, it's not some biblical story. This is not fiction. This is not something made up so that we could illustrate a point. This was a man who apparently had a happy family, had plenty of money. There have been people who've committed suicide because they lost a job. He lost more than that. He lost his flocks his herds, his food, he lost all of his children, he lost his servants, he lost his money, and then he wound up with a nagging wife. This really happened. I don't know whether Job sat there saying, why me, why me? I don't know what went through Job's mind, I have, but I do have God's view of it. Shall we not receive good at the hand of God and not evil also? I believe the suffering of Job was God's design. You can ask all the whys you want. I, I don't ask why. 
The answer must be God does all things right. What we call evil was the design of the almighty majestic God of all creation. I do not believe God sins, but I believe God designs. He's God. Behold, blessed is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. I think evil belief is God's design. And there's God's sovereign will. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. If Tyre and Sidon would have repented long ago, why didn't he do those works there? Who is it that designed that? Certain works would be done in Chorazin and Bethsaida and not in Tyre and Sidon. It wasn't the free will of man. It wasn't the choice of man. You can't, you can't argue that Tyre and Sidon didn't, didn't want it. They didn't want it any more than Chorazin and, and Bethsaida. But the works were done there. And who did that? Who did the works? God Almighty. Who designed it where it was done and where it wasn't done? God Almighty. His design. Think about how that affects your life. And then there's false teaching. False teachings. I already talked about evil, uh, an evil prophet bringing forth error, but how about false teaching? For there must come heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest. God is not saying that they might come. God is saying that by His design, you are going to be faced with teachings which are not biblical. I'm willing to say unto you that it gets worse in every generation. I'm not saying it, it is as bad as it can be, but I am saying that more and more and more there is famine in the land for the hearing of the Word of God. More and more there is that which is becoming more and more impregnated with error. Folks, we need to diligently study this book that they which are approved may be made manifest there are certain men crept in unawares who were before ordained to this condemnation who who ordained them to that it was god's design to show his wrath against sin and to approve those whom he had chosen What about disobedience? I'm also going to suggest that disobedience can be by God's design. Unto you, therefore, which believe that He is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made of the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them who stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto they were also appointed. Who did the appointing? God Almighty. Folks, if you're going to use the word tragedy, what's the, what's the greatest tragedy in all of human history? You know, suppose you were a woman of 
of disrepute out of whom Christ had cast devils. You know, you could sit at his feet in adoration. God Almighty touched your life. Or Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, or Martha and Mary, who heard his words. More than that, the leper who was healed. Did you know there was never a Jewish leper healed? Never. When Christ healed the leper, he told them to go to the high priest. Bear in mind, I, I repeat again, these people were people who really lived. They were like you and like me. Those priests, they had to dust off the books, man. I mean, we've never had a healed leper before. In fact, the Jews were very angry when Christ pointed out that the only leper ever healed in Israel was a Gentile name. That leper who couldn't speak to his friends or couldn't fellowship with his friends, who, you know, who, who couldn't commune in close fellowship around meals and family gatherings. Suddenly, his life is touched and changed by the Master. He's a healed leper. Never happened in Israel's history. Those people gathered to see him crucified. The mob cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Who do you think designed the crucifixion? The multitude who were fed? What, what could lead them to cry out, crucify him? Pilate, you know, hey, don't you know, fellow, I have the power to crucify you and I've got the power to set you free. You know, anybody in their right mind would cow before that power. Christ said, you don't have any power at all except what's been given you from above. You can't tell me that the majority of those people didn't know that He was innocent. And there He hangs on the cross. If you're going to use the word tragedy for a World Trade Center, it pales in, into insignificance compared to the cross of Jesus Christ. Those whom He created, those whose lives He held in the hollow of His hand, nailed Him to the cross. That was by God's design. Pilate said unto Him, don't you know I've got the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And Christ said, you'd have no power at all if it wasn't given you from above. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by Him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreordination of God had ye taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel had determined before to be done. What kind of application do you think that has in your life? How can anyone deny that the God the sovereign monarch of eternity was not, was not, is not in control and was the designer. Now, I don't know what's happened in your life, folks. I don't know, but I know it was God's design and I know that He has a purpose in it. You know, I could have told Jacob, you know, don't worry about Joseph. Hey, you don't have to be sorry. You don't have to be in great despondency because you've lost the son of your old age. Don't worry about it. God knows what He's doing. I could have said that to James. I, I could have told the Israelites, don't worry. Don't worry about evil prophets. 
I could have said that to Samson's parents. You know, don't worry about the waywardness of your son. God knows what he's doing. But that would not have changed the fact that Joseph suffered, that, jo that Job suffered, that Israel suffered, that Samson's parents suffered, that God's people suffer in the presence of evil teaching and heresy, that Christ suffered on the cross. But what I can do is remind you constantly for your comfort that God is in control. God is a God of design and, and purpose, and we can rest in that. God desires that we do rest in that. Dearly beloved, God designs. Not only that, He designs perfectly. As in the original creation, His work on our behalf, your new sinless life, uh, all of His design and purpose, all perfect, all of history, in fact, perfectly designed and all for our comfort while the world worships a God of chance. Don't worship a God of chance. I love you all. I truly do. Join us on Sunday as we continue to study through the epistle to the Galatians. Until then, rest in Him. And thanks for watching.